Good morning, everybody. Uh, to those of you participating online, uh, today's uh, presentations are going to be by our fourth year medical students. Uh, we've uh, had the opportunity uh, to work with five of them this month. They've all done a great job and worked hard on their presentations. And we're looking forward to hearing uh, Matt Weintraub is going to join us first remotely. Uh, and we'll talk about lateral patellar instability. As far as the format goes here, please feel free to uh, direct any questions on Zoom. Um, we'll direct the microphone in the room to any. We'll try to keep the presentations to uh, less than uh, 13 minutes. I'll keep a little bit of time. You guys won't run out of time. Don't worry. We'll make sure you get to do everything you can. Okay. Um, so first we have Matt Weintraub, um, who uh, spent time with us on PEDS. And uh, Matt, what was the other service that you rotated on? Trauma? Uh, yeah, this year was uh, Trauma and Sports. Oh, sorry, sports. I feel like you're always on peace with me. Um, and uh, he is going to present uh, a case of lateral patellar instability you saw in sports. Go ahead, Matt. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, I tested for COVID here, so I'm going to be presenting virtually on surgical management of lateral patellar instability. So the objectives for the talk, uh, we'll review the epidemiology of patellar instability and identify common risk factors. We'll discuss uh, isolated MPFL reconstruction and Fulkerson type tibial tubercle osteotomies and the risk factors that uh, each addresses. And we'll, we'll uh, evaluate the outcomes of MPFL reconstruction and Fulkerson using current literature. So the case, a uh, 13 year old female presents to the office after a third left patellar dislocation that occurred while running. The patient was able to self-reduce. The first uh, dislocation occurred uh, three years ago and the second eight months ago. She's already attempted physical therapy. At this point, the patient endorses pain, swelling, and stiffness of the knee. That's causing her to stay home from school and also ambulate with crutches and a soft knee brace. Uh, left knee range of motion is 5 to 90 degrees with 2 plus effusion. There's tenderness to palpation around the patella. The knee is stable of varus and valgus stress and sensation is intact uh, distally. So we have an AP lateral and sunrise view of the left knee in a skeletally mature individual. Um, there appears to be a small chondral defect um, in the medial patella on the sunrise view. Otherwise, no other fractures, loose bodies, or bony lesions are appreciated. There's no joint line narrowing. Uh, there's moderate soft tissue swelling and joint diffusion. The uh, left patella also demonstrates lateral uh, patellar tilt on the sunrise view. So here we have an axial and coronal T2 weighted MRI demonstrating joint diffusion. Uh, there's also evidence of avulsion of MPFL. Uh, there's medial patella and lateral femoral condyle bone bruising and a cartilage defect on the medial patellar facet. But uh, overall, um, the, uh, there's no significant patellofemoral chondral injury noted. There is evidence of a dysplastic trochlea and TTTG distance is measured at about 18 millimeters. So some background, uh, first time lateral patellar dislocation is relatively common. A uh, recent study out of the Mayo Clinic suggested an incidence of 23 per 100,000 individuals. Uh, but in those uh, aged 14 to 18, the incidence was higher at about 150 per 100,000. If you have two risk factors present, then your risk of redislocation increases to 30 to 60%. Dislocation can be traumatic or atraumatic. So atraumatic is often during sporting activities with a non-contact twisting injury on a slightly flexed knee and externally rotated tibia. You can also have a direct trauma to the uh, medial patella. The reduction maneuver for this is uh, extending the knee. Sometimes that reduces the patella itself. Otherwise you can apply a medially directed force uh, to the patella. First line is trialing non-operative treatment. Uh, that includes physical therapy focused on strengthening vastus medialis to try and overcome the often uh, stronger vastus lateralis. The biomechanics of the knee is uh, inc incredibly complex, so we'll be focusing on the risk factors that are addressed by MPFL reconstruction and Fulkerson osteotomy, but I wanted to mention here for completeness sake, trochlear dysplasia, which is flattening of the trochlear groove. Um, with flattening, you lose the osseous uh, constraint to lateral subluxation. A trochleoplasty would 
specifically be able to fix this, but it's rarely performed in the United States, a little bit more in Europe. But just wanted to mention it here for completeness sake. We'll be focusing right now on MPFL reconstruction and how it addresses a deficient MPFL, either from uh, ligamentous laxity or avulsion from a dislocation event. So MPFL is the primary stabilizer during the initial 20 degrees of knee flexion before the patella engages with the trochlear groove. It's often disrupted during dislocation events. Normally, passive translation of the patella is about half the width of the patella, but deficiency in MPFL can result in increased passive patellar translation. And if you lose that uh, soft tissue restraint, then or if you lose that ligamentous uh, restraint, then you can have increased risk of lateral uh, patellar subluxation and uh, instability. Indications for an isolated MPFL would be someone with recurrent instability who essentially has normal bony um, architecture. There have been many fixation uh, principles that have described in the literature, but probably the most important one to review here is Shottle's point. So MPFL tendon is isometric throughout flexion, and Shottle's point has been shown to reliably reproduce this isometry. It describes the appropriate femoral insertion point for uh, MPFL tendon during reconstruction. You can find this point using fluoroscopy intraoperatively. Here's an example of this. So the blue line represents uh, a line drawn, uh, drawn down the posterior cortex of the femur. The red line is perpendicular to the posterior aspect of Blumensatz line, and the orange line is perpendicular to the intersection point of the posterior femoral condyle and the posterior cortex of the femur. And in between those three lines is Schottel's point. So in a widely cited study from our German colleagues looking at 72 knees in 68 patients that received isolated MPFL reconstruction, uh, median age was 18, minimum two-year follow-up. There were two patients that had recurrent dislocation. One was a soccer player, one was a dancer. They went through three months of physical therapy and didn't have another dislocation event during the follow-up period. Of patients that participated in sports preoperatively, all returned postoperatively, 53% at equal or higher levels. 80% uh, were satisfied or very satisfied. And of note, about one-third had a five to 10 degree loss in flexion of the knee. However, all patients still had over 130 degrees of knee flexion. So this suggests that in the appropriate patient population, uh, this is a successful procedure, but it's important to remember that the indications here uh, were strictly followed. So the inclusion criteria were very strict, uh, reflecting the indications I mentioned on the previous slide. Complications. Um, so Parikh et al. Uh, cited a 16% complication rate uh, with half being due to tunnel malpositioning. So this reiterates the importance of Shottle's point. If you have a femoral tunnel that's placed too uh, anteriorly or proximally, that can lead to increased tightness and flexion. And if you have a tunnel that's placed too distally or posteriorly, you can have tightness in extension. This can lead to pain, stiffness, uh, stretching of the graft, and over time, uh, failure of the graft. So next we'll move on to Fulkerson osteotomy. Uh, here you can see you're uh, moving the tibial tubercle medially, uh, and we'll review Q angle and TTTG distance. So starting with Q angle, you have two lines, one uh, from the patella down through tibial tuberosity, and then another through the patella and ASIS. And the angle between those two lines is the Q angle, and it represents the force vector of the quadriceps. So normally, the quadriceps pulls the patella proximally and slightly laterally, as described by Q angle. This can uh, increase with certain conditions such as genovalgum or femoral antiversion or external tibial rotation, all things where the uh, tibial tuberosity is relatively lateralized compared to normal. With an increased Q angle, it suggests a increased lateral force vector on the patella, which can increase the instability. Trochlear, uh, tibial tuberosity trochlear groove distance is uh, found by drawing two lines, one through the anterior most um, portion of tibial tuberosity and another through the deepest portion of trochlear groove. And the distance between those two lines is your TTTG distance. Again, a more lateralized tibial tuberosity with uh, a increased TTTG distance suggests an associated increased Q angle and again, a increased lateral force vector on the patella. So the indications for a Volkerson osteotomy is someone with recurrent instability who has an increased TTTG distance of greater than 15 to 20 millimeters, 
It's also been shown to successfully address lateral patellar tilt. Classically, um, an indication is an absence of trochlear chondrosis. In a study out of Pittsburgh, 41 Fulkerson osteotomies with concurrent lateral release were performed in 34 patients with a mean age of 20 years and mean follow-up 46 months. There was one patient with recurrent instability. All others were able to return at least to their pre-injury level of sport. The one patient that had recurrent instability was later diagnosed with Erlos Danlos syndrome. Of note, 17 patients required screw removal from this cohort. So again, this shows that in the correct pa uh, patient population, Fulkerson type osteotomy is a successful procedure. But as I alluded to, uh, one of the most common complications at about 50% is hardware removal. Non-union fracture and wound complications all come in at about 1% as well. So for our patient following a normal diagnostic knee arthroscopy, our patient received an MPFL reconstruction with a gracilis autograft and an uh, a Fulkerson type osteotomy with slight anteriorization and about 10 millimeters of medialization. She'll remain in a post-operative brace for six weeks with crutches and toe touch weight bearing. She can begin progressive range of motion with physical therapy about one week post-op and she'll remain out of sports and gym likely up to uh, for up to six months. So to summarize here, it's important to assess the risk factors in each individual presenting with patellar instability if the surgical intervention appropriately addresses the identified risk factors, then outcomes are generally favorable. And if the general indications are followed, both MPFL and Fulkerson can have favorable outcomes. Thank you. Matt, that was a great job, great presentation. I wanted to point out, you actually cited papers authored by two graduates of this medical school and residency program, the Shottles Point paper. Evan Conti was the third author when he was a fellow. And then that, the last the last paper you presented from the University of Pittsburgh, Fotis Jamarcus was a medical student here uh, three years before me, 20 some years ago. Um, so our residents and uh, medical students are going on to do some important academic work. I wanted to point that out. Um, so when you look at these risk factors for <clears throat> dislocation of the patella, patellar instability, and you identify a number of risk factors and you have a first time dislocator. This is a question that I think we all debate, especially in the sports medicine world, but when do you actually make the decision to go ahead and operate? Yeah, I think uh, first line is still a trial of physical therapy. Uh, you have to make sure that you're giving that a good shot to see if you can reduce the rate of dislocation. But once you start dislocating more than once and it starts to affect uh, your daily life, like in this case, the patient uh, was uh, not able to go to school, um, was ambulating with a crutch and a soft knee brace, then I think it's time to start talking about surgical intervention. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And then when you're counseling a patient and you're thinking about the frequency with which they might have a recurrent dislocation and you're reading, you presented some nice statistics on the incidents in the population, but as a first time dislocator, what's the likelihood that you're going to have a redislocation? Overall, it's about 23%. And then once you start to have risk factors on top of that, then it can increase to uh, like if you have two, then that was where that 30 to 60% came in. That's right. That's right. So once you have somebody who's dislocated once, you know, generally, I think a 20 to 30% redislocation rate is probably what you should counsel patients. And that's the rationale for waiting unless you have an intraarticular lesion or other compelling reasons to act. Um, a second time dislocator residents, do you know how often they might dislocate again? You've had two patellar dislocations. Yeah, it's a step up. It's about 50%. Okay. And then once you have three, it's about 70. And obviously it's a diminishing return after that. So I tend to give people, you know, one or two chances. Obviously, I don't do these reconstructions, um, but I will refer them to Dr. Harnley. Um, you know, once I've had somebody who uh, has had a dislocation, you know, certainly more than two times or has significant risk factors. I think the other thing to point out is that there is a risk, you know, with ligamentous laxity as well. So you want to make sure you get a good assessment of the flexibility of their soft tissues. Uh, as a component of this, because uh, certainly we all have seen patients who have more patellar glide, um, you know, without apprehension, and that probably uh, puts them at risk as well. Do we have any comments from anybody online? I have a question. Um, what it's in this case, you did two procedures, right? Correct. So what's the, what was the pathology? Why two? It seems like the literature shows that if you do one, the one works. <laughs> 
So what what are you what was being treated in this case? So in this case, the MPFL reconstruction was performed for the avulsion of MPFL um, during uh, from the dislocation event as uh, evidence on the MRI. The Fulkerson osteotomy was performed due to evidence of trochlear dysplasia, of which the uh, MPFL wouldn't uh, address, and also lateral patellar tilt, uh, as well as uh, increased TTTG distance of 18 millimeters that was increased as well. Well, how do you how do you know? I mean, the patient dislocated and has and is missing a ligament. How can you address those other problems before you fix the ligament? Are you saying that that once the ligament is reconstructed, all those parameters will still remain abnormal? You know that. The uh, it's my understanding that the bony abnormalities related to trochlear dysplasia and and uh, TTTG just distance those would still remain abnormal. Um, there was a paper that looked at isolated MPFL versus uh, Fulkerson osteotomy and MPFL, uh, but and, and that one showed no difference, but they didn't look. It was a uh, study that uh, looked at, uh, it was a prospectively enrolled study, but patient, uh, surgeons had their the ability to decide which procedure to, to, um, to perform for each patient. So if someone had trochlear dysplasia, then the surgeon was more likely to perform a Fulkerson osteotomy in addition to MPFL. Uh, and so there's been no great uh, prospective study showing uh, whether an isolated MPFL versus an MPFL and Fulkerson osteotomy together can lead to better outcomes. But based on the classic indications, whenever you have bony abnormalities, then an isolated MPFL is not enough uh, in, in, by itself. Right, but didn't people just do a Fulkerson before we had this, before we had the technology to do the reconstruction, we were just doing a Fulkerson and it worked. Weren't the Fulkersons done for instability? Uh, correct. And weren't the people who had instability, didn't they have deficient uh, ligaments? Uh, likely if, if the MPFL wasn't reconstructed. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they worked 90, 98% of the time. Yeah, it seems like the uh, the trend now is to, uh, based on the current literature and some of the more recent studies, to perform an, uh, an MPFL reconstruction if you see evidence of disruption uh, at the time of MRI while you're I mean, performing focus. Yeah, this, this is a very difficult uh, question and issue. I mean, it's I maybe a little more complicated, and I'm, I, I apologize for, you know, addressing it. Maybe the person who did the case or who knows more about it could address it, but it just seems like we're doing a lot of things. We don't have literature to clearly support it. We certainly have a lot of literature that shows that these separate procedures work and we've just added an, another procedure. So the question is, does everybody who has some uh, deformity go on to a patella dislocation? And the answer is probably not. And many of them, only 20% or whatever, will have recurrence. So it sounds like we're doing an awful lot of work <clears throat> to address problems that we're not quite sure that that's really a factor. So I think you would need a prospective randomized study with these parameters to see if there's really a difference. We certainly have studies that show individually they work. Can anyone senior comment on that or? No? Yeah, yeah Dr. Kirschenbaum, as you know, this is a multifactorial problem and the history of the answers with surgery to help address it have oscillated over time, as you alluded. And I think the literature with these small groups of uh, patients have shown success with short follow-up, but I think those of us that see these patients over a longer amount of time, unfortunately, my experience has been that there can be a higher risk of recurrent dislocation uh, over time. So I think that doing more to help address these problems is uh, sometimes tempting. Um, we don't know the answer is the bottom line. And I think that, as you said, it's a great question that hopefully someday we'll have an answer to. But this remains a problem that people have a lot of different solutions for. Thank you. Is there a reason why you don't countersink those screws? The screws are always prominent. You put them in, you could always feel them. Is there a reason why we don't countersink them so they're flush with the tibia? I do. Oh. It looked like the distal one was, was, was sitting out pretty proud. <laughs> 
in the interest of time, I think we'll move on to the next presentation. Great job, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to switch back to the uh, presentation at the uh, podium here. Just give us a second. And uh, Harsh Patel is going to present next. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Harsh, and today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about adolescent louse disease. So to start off with the case, the patient was a 13-year-old male, African-American male with a past medical history of autism spectrum disorder and long QT. He presented with a deformity affecting his left lower extremity. In the past, he's tried corrective measures, but they failed. So he came in looking for a more definitive uh, fix for his deformity. On physical exam, um, the two main things to note were uh, his obese body habitus, which I'll go into more detail later. And there is uh, an apparent varus deformity of the left femur. Uh, lower extremity alignment films were uh, ordered and they showed a varus deformity of the knee with equal contributions from the femur uh, and the tibia. And so to show uh, these images, uh, you could see uh, there's, at least on the on the right, picture on the right, um, there's, there's a pretty gross varus deformity at the at the femur, which uh, seems to be worse than in the proximal tibia. Um, so to talk a little bit more about uh, the etiology and epidemiology of adolescent blouse disease, simplest way I could put it is it's really a growth disturbance of the medial proximal tibial physis. And it actually results in a multi-planar three-dimensional deformity. The name itself indicates just a varus deformity of the proximal tibia, but this is not true. Generally, there's also a procurvatum uh, deformity of the proximal tibia, along with an internal torsion of the tibia as well. You could also develop distal femoral varus deformities and uh, distal tibial valgus deformities. Not everyone develops those, but there are possibilities as well. Risk factors include um, uh, obesity, being African-American or, or being of African-American descent, um, and then being a male. And our patient had all three risk factors. So in terms of etiology and like the pathophysiology, there isn't a singular cause that causes this pathology. It's really a multifactorial process, uh, which uh, affects genetically susceptible individuals. The main takeaway here is there is a strong mechanical overload on the medial proximal tibial physis. Uh, and this is something that's in align with a, a principle known as the huter volkman principle. And essentially what the principle states is that when you have high axial loads or compressive forces on the growth plate, you can actually stunt growth. And if you uh, decompress the physis, you can kind of restore, restore growth if there's any remaining. And that's essentially one of the goals of surgery. Uh, and then this last point here about vitamin D deficiency, uh, it's something I put on here because I found it to be uh, intriguing when I was researching the topic. Uh, there's uh, more and more, or there's a theory out there, or there's uh, there's a thought that patients who have very low vitamin D levels, they're actually at an increased risk of developing uh, Blount's disease. And the first study I ever found that quantified this was I think it came out in 2010 by Montgomery et al. And it showed an increased risk of about 7.33 fold if you had vitamin D levels below 16 nanograms or 16, sorry, one six. And so in, in terms of clinical features, uh, this is a typical presentation uh, that I have highlighted over here on the left. Uh, of course, the, uh, in real practice, this is not always the case. Uh, generally, they, they do tend to be male teenagers because it's the adolescent subtype. Um, in terms of being African-American, a lot of patients are, but that's not always the case. You could also have Hispanic uh, patients who develop it or even uh, Caucasians as well. In terms of obese, hab uh, obese habitus, uh, this is something I want to underscore, the degree of obesity. On average, they tend to sit at around like the 95th percentile or even higher for their weight in terms of age and height. So the degree of, or the severity of obesity is, is quite high. 
Um, and in terms of being unilateral versus bilateral, in the adolescent subtype, most cases tend to be unilateral, but that's not to say that bilateral deformities cannot exist. They certainly can. Um, but bilateral deformities are more common in the infantile subtype of Blount's disease. The reasons that patients seek care uh, include the deformity, which can cause not just physical distress, but also psychological distress. And then they tend to have uh, aching pain concerns located in the medial and antromedial aspect of the knee. Uh, I don't know what happened there. There we go. Okay, so I wanna move on and talk a little bit about radiographic clues. And over here, I just wanted to highlight a couple points in way that are like distinguishing feature, features of adolescent blunt disease from the infantile subtype. I know age is the most obvious, just based off the name, but there are certain radiographic clues that kind of distinguish this pathology. The first is the normal epiphyseal shape. Um, there's really not that much deformity of the epiphysis in, uh, adolescent, in the adolescent subtype. This is generally because the epiphysis has uh, ossified by the time the deformity develops, so it's not as severe. There's also a lack of beaking of the medial tibial metaphysis or the medial proximal tibial metaphysis. Um, and so that's another thing you see in the infant, infantile subtype where you do notice the, the beaking that's far more pro prominent. Uh, you could also see widening of the proximal medial tibial physeal plate, which you could see over here on this image. Uh, you guys can't see my cursor, but uh, uh, it's, it's present. And then you could also see widening of the lateral distal femoral physis. That is something that's kind of unique to uh, the adolescent subtype uh, because, of, because of the distal femoral varus deformity that, that you can find within this pathology. So in terms of key radiographic measures, when I was reading about Blount's disease as a, as a whole, this is one of the radiographic measurements uh, that, that they talked about a lot, which was a metaphyseal diaphyseal angle. And you can see it in the image on the right. And so essentially the angle between the green line that's through the axial plane of the tibial metaphysis and then the line just above that, uh, the angle that's created between those two lines, if it's greater than 11 degrees, this is more indicative of Blount's disease versus more of a physiologic process, which you can see in younger individuals. And that's more relevant for infantile Blount's, but as you look at adolescent Blount's, they do use more of a tibial femoral angle in a normalized uh, standing radiograph as far as risk of progression goes. Yep, yep. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. And then on the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about more other radiographic measurements that you can use to quantify the malalignment in the lower extremity. This can get quite complex, but a couple that I wanted to point out were the mechanical axis deviation, the LDFA, which is the mechan mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, which you can see on the image on the right and the mechanical medial proximal tibial angle. And those can, those can be used to quantify the, the severity of the varus deformity. So in terms of the MPTA, a value that is uh, less than 85 or for every degree less than 85, that, and these values differ, like the degrees vary by one or two depending on the sources, but uh, less than 85 I've read constitutes a varus deformity. And for the LDFA, anything greater than 90 constitutes a varus deformity in the distal femur. Um, so in terms of the treatment for adolescent Blount's disease, uh, of course, there is the non-operative approach, but this is almost never done or it's very rarely done because the outcomes tend to be poor. You risk progression of the deformity, which is never, never a good idea. And you can actually cause further damage to the medial, of the medial joint in the knee. You alter the kinematics and you increase the risk of developing degenerative arthritis. And so that's why surgery is often uh, the mainstay approach with a, a high tibial osteotomy or an osteotomy in general is, is preferred because it allows for a three-dimensional correction, uh, which is kind of, which is essentially what makes treating this pathology difficult because the deformity is often three-dimensional to correct it in all the planes. You have the most control when you do an osteotomy. Um, osteotomy is often achieved with either internal fixation or external fixation. Uh, if you do it acutely, meaning you do the entire correction in that one surgery, you can use either internal fixation or external fixation. But another approach is you can do gradual correction uh, over time. So that is often accomplished using an, a circular external 
fixator device. And there's pros and cons to both. Um, for the at least for the ex, for the circular external fi fixator device and choosing the gradual correction approach, um, there's a, there's thought to be a lower risk for complications, less risk for neurovascular injury, um, uh, less chances of developing compartment syndrome, uh, and you can also do something known as um, you can you can use distraction osteogenesis. So if there is a limb length uh, discrepancy, if you choose if you choose if you treat it using gradual correction with the circular external fixator, you can use the principle of distraction osteogenesis to kind of correct for any residual limb length deformity. Um, so those are the two options. You can do osteotomies using the the high the HCO will address the proximal tibia deformity, and the distal femoral osteotomy will be used to correct. The, the deformity in the, in the distal femur. You can also have uh, in your arsenal of tools, you can also use the hemiepiphysiodesis. Um, this is a, a less invasive, less morbid procedure. And essentially what you do is you try to tether the lateral physis. And by doing this, uh, you will try to accomplish a gradual correction of the growth plate. So you don't want, you essentially want to clamp down on uh, uh, growth on the lateral physis, so the medial physis can uh, kind of catch up and gradually correct the deformity over time. Uh, the indications and when you would do that is it requires a growth, like growth potential to be remaining in the physial plate. Uh, in terms of an exact number, I read that at least two years of growth potential is, um, is desirable if you are, if, before you do this. And the other thing here is that it's better to perform a hemiepiphysiodesis when you have a mild to moderate deformity. Whereas when you have severe angulation and severe varus deformities, you're better off doing an osteotomy. The other thing is that when you do a hemiepiphysiodesis, you need close clinical follow-up. So if these patients don't follow up in the clinic and uh, your staple or your screw-in plate is still on the lateral physis, you can risk uh, overcorrection. And then the patient has to go back twice for surgery one, to remove the hardware, and two, to correct the overcorrection, so they'll have to undergo an osteotomy. I would add, Harsh, that your photo there shows more common complication. 50% of them, the eight plates break at the screw plate interface, and they fail, so you need clinical follow-up to make sure it's actually working. Yep. So in terms of uh, patient GH and his surgical course, he, he, need, he required a distal femoral osteotomy to be performed first. Um, this was first done to see if the mechanical uh, axis could be restored. Unfortunately, after performing the distal femoral osteotomy, the mechanical axis was inadequate. So then he, during, during the same procedure, of course, he underwent a high tibial osteotomy. Um, and that was, uh, that, and for that, we used 4.5 millimeter proximal tibial plates with locking screws. Uh, and that was sufficient to restore the anatomic alignment of the tibia and the overall mechanical access. So these are some intraoperative radiographs. Here's another one. And then uh, I wanted to take some time to talk a little bit more about, this intrigued me, like, uh, how, like how successful osteotomies are. So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in terms of uh, what are like the objective and, and uh, subjective outcomes of these patients following uh, HTO or DFO? And so this was a great study that came out of JBJS. It's kind of an older study. I think it came out in 2005, but it, it's one of the few studies with a, a desirable follow-up of at least, I mean, this one had five years, so it's better than uh, having like a year or two of follow-up. So it was a case series of 15 patients. They treated about 19 lower extremities. And the patients they treated here were, they had quite severe deformities. I mean, they had deformities of the proximal tibia, the distal femur, and the distal tibia. Um, and most of these were treated using uh, an HTO or a DFO. In some cases where it was like a mild or moderate deformity, they used hemiepiphyseal stapling. But most of the patients uh, were treated using an osteotomy. There was only a few that, that underwent the stapling. And so in terms of outcomes, this is, they measured more parameters, but these are the ones that are kind of, that were the easiest to follow for me. And you can see from pre-op to post-op, the mechanical axis deviation, just from being 108 millimeters 
it went all the way down to one millimeters, which is within the normal range. And the LDFA and MPTA, which I talked about a few slides ago, uh, you want it to generally fall between 85 and 90. And you can see how post-op uh, it actually was aligned pretty well. So that was, that, was, that was astounding. And it shows how corrective the surgery is. Um, at, at five years, 95% of legs were pain-free. No patients really had any, any complaints. In terms of complications, uh, this, this study only used an external fixator. And so because of that, you're at a higher risk of developing superficial uh, pin track infections. Um, but even then, only one patient out of the 15 developed it, and they, all, they had infections at two of the pin sites, which, and they were treated successfully using oral antibiotics. There was no like major adverse events, no uh, deep infections, no neurovascular events, no compartment syndrome, no non-unions, non nothing like that. The next study I found um, was, it was similar to the previous study, except the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about this is because they actually looked at uh, a P PRO, so like more like a subjective outcome in terms of these patients. So they essentially use something known as the HSS knee score, um, which is a patient reported outcome measure. And they found uh, statistically significant improvement in not just all the objective measurements or radiographic measurements that you could use to assess your surgical treatment. But in terms of this knee score, they, av they averaged yeah, they improved on average 42 points, which is a, a large jump. So they went from 51 to 94.2 on that knee score scale. And the difference was significant. In terms of, um, in terms of complications, uh, I don't know why, maybe there's variations in surgical techniques, but more patients in this cohort developed superficial pin site infections. And unfortunately, one patient developed a deep infection that required washout. Um, Again, that's something that's not common, but it did occur within the study. But in terms of uh, things like developing septic arthritis or osteomyelitis, fractures, neurovascular injuries, compartment syndrome, loss of alignment, none of that occurred. And this, I think the, uh, the follow-up for this was about 33.22 months. Um, and so, yeah, basically these two, two studies kind of substantiate or corroborate how successful of a, of a procedure a high tibial osteotomy or a, a distal femoral osteotomy is. And it's an excellent treatment modality for treating everything from like moderate to severe cases of late onset tibia vera. And this one last study I wanted to briefly touch on was um, after, after looking at the findings of the previous two studies, I wanted to know if there was any difference in terms of acute versus gradual correction of tibia vera. And so there isn't that much out there in the literature regarding this, unfortunately, but I did find this systematic review uh, and it assessed 18 articles. There was no prospective studies or RCTs. Uh, so there isn't a lot of high quality evidence out there. Everything they analyzed was uh, either level three or level four. And the one retrospective study that was level three, they reported weak evidence of better mechanical access deviation correction if you were, are to use a gradual corrective approach. But there are some pitfalls to their methodology. It wasn't randomized. They only had 14 patients. Patients weren't matched, so there were baseline differences, um, and they essentially had low power. The other 17 studies out of the 18 that uh, this review encapsulated, it showed no form of advantage over X-fix over internal fixation. So based on this, there's like very little evidence to recommend one form correction over the other. I think it's important to emphasize that it really depends on the degree of deformity, as you mentioned, in three planes. In this case that you presented, Harsh, this is my case, um, there were behavioral factors that went into not using an X-fix, and X-fix often has an advantage for being able to translate the tibia, but the child had a previous growth modulation with an eight-plate, and that had corrected a lot of the translatory deformity, uh, so that allowed us to do the internal fixation in this way, so you have to consider that. Mm, yeah, and of course, and also with the external fixator device, I don't have images on, on this talk, but um, they, they can be quite bulky. So compliance is, a, is a, another issue that you have to take into account as well. As, yep. a, as a, so. Good. You know, if you look at Draw Paley's studies on this, ex, you know, Lizarov's using this initially, they have a 100% complication rate. It just depends on how he defined complications. Some of them he called obstacles. Some of them he called complications. But this is 
you know, a technique that works well, but it has to be the, in the right patient. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so, uh, these are my uh, Dr. Perry, I have a question. Oh yeah, of course. Nice, nice job. Nice presentation. Um, you said at the time of the operation, when you did the femoral osteotomy, and then you checked your alignment. Unfortunately, at that point, the alignment wasn't what you had anticipated. So you went ahead and did a tibial osteotomy. Is there any way that you could have predicted that pre-op with pre-op planning? Is there anything that you should be doing before you go into the operating room to know exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to do it? So I, I personally haven't seen like the pre-operative uh, planning process and how the alignment is achieved. From my understanding, though, it is it is quite complex and it is time intensive. Um, but no, I, I have not seen like the actual ins and outs of the. Well, I think Harsh, you looked, you showed us the diagrams of what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you know our preoperative discussion, we went in thinking we would have to do osteotomies in both. We were hoping that there might be a possible way of correcting the femur and avoiding doing osteotomy in the tibia because they take a little longer to heal. It's more surgery for this kid. Um, but I had no illusions going in that I was probably going to have to do a proximal tibial osteotomy as well. And we corrected the femoral osteotomy to the mechanical axis that we wanted. And then um, the tibia still had, you know, nine or 10 degrees of error. So we, you know, we went ahead and corrected that. Um, there were two different preoperative films, one from another surgeon who referred the kid in. And then I took uh, better films and my film suggested that there was deformity that needed to correct. The other one didn't. So positioning and how you assess these is really important too. But uh, I know you said, unfortunately, and I said, no, nah, I kind of always thought we were going to do a tibial osteotomy. I was hoping we could get away with it, but there was no way. And there's one factor you didn't mention is that there was, there's lateral collateral ligament uh, laxity in this kid. And so if you undercorrect him, you worry about him having a problem with the LCL. There's some people who actually try to advance it and over sew it a little bit. Um, I don't have any experience with that. I just generally try to overcorrect their mechanical axis a little bit so that that's not an issue. Get uh, more symmetric weight bearing through the knee. I think we're right. running out of time. I think we need to move on to the next presentation, but that's a great, great question, Phil. Just use tracing paper and do the osteotomy in the office, and then you can see what you're going to end up with. That's, that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you, everybody. Phil, what's tracing paper? Do you use a mouse with it? No, you just uh, take a piece of your paper that you used to cover uh, the exam tables that you change with every I'm paper. I'm kidding, Phil. And you put it, oh, okay. And you put it on an <laughs> x-ray and you just trace it out and cut it and then realign the bone and look what you need to do. It works very well. Vivian, go ahead. Hi, so my name is Vivian. Uh, my presentation today is on acromioclavicular joint injuries. So this is an outline of my presentation. I'll go over a case first, followed by some background information, then I'll go into management options and some controversies in management. Uh, so our first case, uh, this patient is a 32-year-old male who fell off his bike. He had prominence over his AC joint and limited active as well as passive range of motion in the right upper extremity. So these are his radiographs showing pretty significant displacement um, of the AC joint. Um, so going over some brief anatomy, um, the AC joint com uh, compo is composed of the clavicle, the chromium, and the crocoid. The main static stabilizers of the AC joint are ligaments. These include the coracoacromial ligament, which contributes primarily to horizontal stability, the AC ligament, which con contributes primarily to anterior and uh, posterior stability, and coracoclavicular ligaments. These include the trapezoid ligament and the conoid ligaments. Both of these ligaments uh, contribute to vertical stability and are considered the most important ligaments to reconstruct during an AC uh, joint injury. On the right over here is an MRI showing all of these ligaments in addition to attachments of the trapezius and deltoid muscles. Uh, both of these muscles and in particular the deltopectorial fascia contributes to dynamic stability of the joint. In terms of incidence, um, AC joints AC joint injury commonly occur as a result of direct trauma to the superior or lateral shoulder. It's involved in about nine to 12% of shoulder girdle injuries. It's more common in males than females and it most commonly occurs in the 20s to 30s age group. 
So diagnosis is made by AP radiographs of both the injured and contralateral side uh, in order to evaluate the amount of displacement on the injured side. Uh, Zonka views are also helpful. They're essentially AP radiographs, but with a 10 to 15 degree superior angle tilt uh, of the X-ray beam in order to be better visualize the AC joint. Uh, axillary views are also helpful for visualizing the direction of dislocation. The Rockwell classification is the most common classification system used to describe AC joint injuries. Uh, there are six types. Um, anything above a type two involves uh, injury to the CC ligament. So in type one, the AC ligament is strained, but the CC ligament is intact, uh, resulting in a normal coracoclavicular or CC distance. Um, in type two, the AC ligament is disrupted and the CC ligament is also disrupted, resulting in a less than 25% increase in CC distance. Type three, there's a 25 to 100% um, increase in CC distance. And type four, there's actually posterior displacement of the clavicle. Uh, type five is a more serious type three injury with about 100 to 300% displacement. Um, and type six is the most rare type of, is the rarest type of injury. And it is an inferior displacement of the clavicle relative to the coracoid. There are a couple of different management options for AC joint injuries. These include both non-operative and surgical treatments. Non-operative treatments tend to be used for type one to type three um, dis dislocations. These include immobilization via sling, activity modification, rest, and physical therapy. Surgical treatments are usually reserved for type three and above injuries. These can be broadly categorized into ORIF and ligament reconstructions. So for ORIF, you have screws, sutures, um, K-wire, pins, hook plates. And for ligament reconstructions, you have uh, reconstructions using coracoacromial ligament and free tendon grafts. So on the right over here, um, this shows a suture button fixation. Uh, complications of non-operative treatment include residual pain, limited range of motion, instability, obvious deformity, and loss of reduction. Operative treatments carry similar complications, but with the added complications of infection, hardware migration, bone erosion, and arthritis. So on the right here, it shows a preoperative right type five AC joint dislocation. Uh, it was treated with suture button fixation. You can see here on the post-operative, immediate post-op x-rays. Uh, however, about four months out from the surgery, there was some loss of reduction. There is a significant controversy surrounding treatment of AC joint dislocations. Um, for type one and type two injuries, the general consensus is non-operative treatment. However, for type three and above uh, dislocations, there's uh, significant controversy surrounding the treatment options. Over here is a figure that I pulled from a systematic review showing the number of papers published on surgical techniques for AC joint fixation. So not only is there controversy surrounding whether or not we should do operative versus non-operative treatment, there's also controversy surrounding which operative treatment is the best type of treatment. Uh, so I'll briefly go over some literature regarding operative versus non-operative treatments. So the first paper I have here is on a Cochrane review regarding surgical versus conservative interventions for acromion clavicular dislocations in adults. This uh, included five studies total. Uh, the primary outcomes measured were pain, motion, and function. Um, overall, they found no difference in operative versus non-operative treatments. Uh, all patients had type three and above injuries. However, the authors of this paper did note that most of the studies included were very low powered with significant risk of bias. Um, the next paper I have is also a systematic review. It also is comparing operative versus non-operative treatment of AC joint dislocations. This study included 15 studies, um, primary level two and level three uh, uh, papers. Um, favorable outcomes was determined by authors in each individual study. So there was pretty significant uh, variation in regards to how a uh, favorable outcome was determined. It usually was a combination between subjective and objective scoring, including pain, motion, and function. Um, again, this, this systematic review found that overall, there's no difference between um, operative versus non-operative treatment. And this again included patients who had type three and above AC joint dislocations. Uh, next, I'll go over one paper on suture button fixation versus hook plate fixation. Suture button fixation is a relatively newer technique. It can be done arthroscopically. Uh, hook plate fixations have been around longer and they tend to be done via an open procedure. So here, there, this is a, a meta-analysis, uh, including eight studies uh, comparing su suture button fixation versus hook plate fixation. They overall found a slight um, they overall favored suture button fixation. They found that suture button fixation had higher constant scores and lower pain scores. 
but there is no difference between uh, loss of reduction rates, complication rate, and OR time between suture button fixation and hook plate fixation. So going back to our patient, uh, the 32-year-old male with a type 5 AC joint dislocation, he was treated with arthroscopic suture button fixation. Uh, here are two intraoperative photos showing where the suture buttons were placed. These are his immediate post-op films showing good reduction. Uh, and I have one more case presentation um, just to demonstrate the variability and treatment of AC joint dislocations. So this again is a male in his 30s. He slipped on grass while running and he has he also had similar tenderness to palpation over his left AC joint and pain with shoulder abduction. Um, he had slightly less displacement than the first patient. So we opted to treat him conservatively with a sling. These are his post reduction films. Um, and treatment will depend on a variety of factors, which include attending preference, amount of pain the patient is in, patient's level of activity, and amount of closed reduction that can be achieved. Uh, that's it for my presentation. So Vivian, you present something that I've always found uh, challenging and confusing the way we fix these, you know, over the years and whether we fix them or not, you know, there were moving indications. As you read this literature, you have five shoulder surgeons or more on the call right now. What would you want to know about um, how to best treat this? What are your lingering questions that you might ask to the five people on the call here? Um, I guess in terms of the different types of operative treatments, do any of the attendings have a specific preference of one type over another, um, or is it patient dependent? So I wanna chime in. I think very nice review, did a great job. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure you alluded to in terms of choice of surgery is the timing of when you kept to the patient because there's um, you know there's a very small window to be able to do a, a repair where you're going to use one of these techniques whether it's a hook plate or these dog bones with a suture repair uh, and rely on the patient's own biology and own, own anatomy to, to let those ligaments heal you know you get to about the three or four week mark and the ability for that to heal when it's reduced is diminished and there, therefore you have to get into those reconstructive procedures whether you're using tendon graft or uh, or other other technique, um, and so that that for me is is a big ticket item. When when did it happen? How long did it take to get for them to get in to see you? And how quickly can you get them into the operating room to fix it? Is a very strong determinant as, as to which technique you're going to use. Um, as far as you know, is one better than the other? I mean, I think there's issues. The hook plate almost always has to be removed, so there's a second surgery involved many times. Um, the sutures can, you know, can loosen, and so in almost every case I've tried to do with the suture repair, they, 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 they never stay anatomic, so they don't have a lot of problems. They don't complain a lot, but they're, they don't stay down as, as well as I would like them to, so there's pluses and minuses on both sides, and, and, and I still think it's, it's somewhat of an open-ended question. I mean, the difference between a three and a five is very very judgmental <laughs> you know um if you're not examining the patient and you know stressing them and feeling is the clavi pectoral fascia or the superior clavicle fascia torn i think that's an important piece of the puzzle as well how bad is the deformity how active is the patient you know many of these and mo and i would argue maybe most of them should be treated not operatively so you have to carefully select the patients that you're going to fix this for thank you dr letty I think uh, if there are no other questions, it'd be a nice job. I think we'll move on to the next uh, talk uh, so we can keep up with time. That's going to be uh, Brian Bueno. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, your time this morning. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, surgical management of bicondylar to leo plateau fractures. Objectives for this presentation, uh, I'll be discussing the epidemiology, anatomy, and common classification systems uh, used to uh, analyze bi bicondylar tib tibial plateau fractures. I'll also be describing the surgical interventions um, used for the management of these fractures, and also we'll be diving into a comparison of the, these treatment options uh, using relevant literature. Uh, to start off with a case presentation, uh, patient JC 
Uh, she's a 67 year old female uh, who fell down uh, 11 steps uh, and reported to the ED with right sided knee pain. Uh, she has a medical history of end stage renal disease and diabetes mellitus. Um, she received a deceased donor kidney transplant in 2010. Um, she also had a right sided femoral intramedullary nail um, in 2020, uh, right sided ipsilateral, ipsilateral, just wanted to point out ipsilateral to the side of her pain. Um, her medications include prednisone and Prograf for her uh, kidney transplant in 2010, also Humalog and Lepimir for her diabetes mellitus. Uh, for regarding her uh, physical exam, her right, right lower extremity, she had uh, intact skin, uh, swelling and tenderness to palpation of the right knee. Uh, her compartments were soft and compressible. Uh, that's relevant for um, reasons I'll explain later in the, this presentation. Uh, her ABI was 1.0, which is normal. Uh, she also had intact sensation uh, to the distribution of the superficial and deep peroneal nerves and also the tibial nerve. Um, her uh, motor function was also intact uh, for the tibialis anterior, gastrocnemius, and EHL and FHL. Uh, and pulses were also two plus bilaterally on the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibialis. Uh, here's some imaging um, taken uh, upon her uh, visit to the ED. Um, we have an AP of the tibia amphibia and a lateral of the tibia amphibia. Uh, we can see here, if you can see my pointer on the screen, um, we have a lateral split here at the lateral condyle of the tibia, also a medial split at the medial condyle of the tibia. Uh, also important to point out is uh, there's a uh, dissociation between the metaphysis and diaphysis of the tibia. Also, some apologize for the quality of the CT here, but um, we can see it. Uh, on the axial view as we come anterior is on the left. Um, we can see a uh, pretty severe comminution of the uh, tibial plateau um, with our uh, lateral split coming out of the screen now, but medial and lateral split um, with also a uh, comminution on the posterior aspect of the tibia. Some background for bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. Um, or in general, tibial plateau fractures uh, consist of 1% of all fractures uh, specific to bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. Um, 18 to 39% of all tibial plateau fractures are bicondylar. Uh, they're highly associated with uh, high energy injuries, uh, particularly motor vehicle collisions. Uh, 43 to 80% involve ligamentous injuries. <clears throat> and uh, they're highly associated with soft tissue injury and also neurovascular injury, uh, particularly the common peroneal nerve as it um, wraps around the head of the fibula. Uh, 11 to 27% of these injuries are also associated with compartment syndrome, uh, which is why I pointed out um, just, uh, this patient during her visit to the ED, she had uh, soft compartments of the, of the leg. Uh, relevant anatomy for, uh, for bicondylar tibial plateau fractures, um, of course, the the lateral, uh, lateral condyle of the tibia um, here and also the medial, medial condyle of the tibia. Um, important to point out, um, considering uh, bicondylar tibial plateau fractures, well, you'll have uh, a split in both condyles. Um, this is not always the case with all tibial, tibial plateau fractures and uh, bicondylar plateau fractures. Also, uh, the ligamentous structures uh, such as the ACL, PCL, MCL, and also the menisci uh, that articulate at the tibial plateau. Common classification systems for tibial plateau fractures uh, include Schatzker classification um, with six subtypes. The first is a lateral split. The second is a lateral split with depression. Um, third is a um, depression only. Uh, fourth is medial split, the medial condyle. Uh, five is a um, lateral and medial split, and six is, uh, it, you can have lateral and medial split, but most of what makes this uh, different from the others is dissociation of the metaphysis from the diaphysis, which we saw in this case. Uh, there's also the whole and more classification. Uh, this involves a uh, evulsion of the lateral, uh, uh, of the lateral condyle. Also, um, uh, type two is, uh, uh, 
a split of an entire condyle off of the uh, remaining portion of the tibial plateau. Uh, three is a avulsion of the lateral condyle. Uh, four is a depression of either the medial or lateral condyle. And type five is a four-part fracture of the tibial plateau. So the operative indications for bicondylar, specifically for bicondylar tibial plateau fractures, uh, involves include instability with a, with a, the knee joint in, in extension, uh, varus malalignment, and greater than five degrees of valgus malalignment. So treatment options, uh, surgical treatment options for, um, for these injuries, uh, considering bicondylar plateau fractures are typically always treated surgically. Um, there are uh, different surgical options. Uh, first listed here is the stage fixation, um, which uh, is one of the more common, uh, commonly performed procedures um, uh, to address the swelling, that increased swelling that can occur with these injuries. Uh, first, there's immediate temporary external fixation um, performed in the operating room. Then after uh, a time period to allow swelling to reside and allow you to make necessary incisions to perform your uh, open reduction and internal fixation, um, that allows the, this delay in time allows you to actually do the ORF and close properly to reduce um, risk of infection. Uh, the alternative is an external fixator with limited ORIF. Um, this can be done with or without staged ORIF. Uh, the term limited ORIF uh, typically refers to percutaneous um, screws that are uh, placed across the tibial plateau to hold the reduction rather than uh, plates. Um, so to discuss uh, some of the literature that compares these surgical options, uh, this is a paper out of the uh, Knee Journal. Um, it basically is comparing um, lateral fixation, um, which is a single incision laterally um, and using a, a lateral locking plate to hold your reduction. So it's only one sided, uh, a one sided plate. And it's comparing, this paper is comparing that to dual plating, um, which is, of course is a lateral incision to place your lateral plate and also a medial incision to place um, medial plate. So you have uh, fixation on both sides of the tibial plateau. So they, this was a, um, a uh, study to comparing that, comparing these two surgical options, 86 patients were involved and um, analyzed uh, for the study. And these patients underwent uh, dual plate or single lateral locking plate, ORIF. Um, interestingly, uh, the study found um, single, single lateral locking plate technique um, actually had significantly uh, decreased blood loss, hospital stay, operative duration, and rates of delayed union. Um, this, is somewhat intuitive considering this is a single incision rather than two. Um, however, some there are cases when um, a single lateral locking plate is not a not an option. Um, you have to uh, the purpose of obtaining CT scans is to take a look at the degree of comminution, um, where your fragments are, um, and that ultimately uh, leads you to the the operative um, uh, strategy. Um, so in this case, uh, a patient, uh, I believe, had a, a posterior, posterior medial uh, fragment, which uh, precludes, precludes uh, physicians from performing only, only lateral locking technique. Um, this wouldn't sufficiently hold the reduction of, uh, hold the reduction of the fracture. And next is a uh, RCT out of JBJS comparing ORIF, um, ORIF with with external fixation uh, and limited ORI, limited ORIF. Uh, this study found that this was an RCT of including 83 fractures. Um, it found that circular fixators, which is our, the external fixators with limited ORIF, um, limited ORIF being the percutaneous screws, uh, actually provided faster return to baseline function at six and 12 month follow-up, uh, which is interesting um, and also uh, lower complication and reoperation rates, uh, whereas there's no significant differences uh, in terms of range of motion and length of stay in the hospital. Um, this is, these findings are, can change management. However, patient, putting an external fixator on a patient is not always uh, the best option. Um, uh, external fixators are appropriate uh, when, as I mentioned before, the degree of soft tissue swelling uh, the degree of actual injury to the soft tissue um, 
a ORIF might not ever actually be an option for a patient with severe degree of soft tissue injury. So external fixation is, is the best option for those patients. Um, but interesting findings uh, regardless. Uh, this was a, a, also a study comparing uh, uh, ORIF with external fixators and limited ORIF. Similar findings, uh, faster return to baseline um, in patients who underwent external fixation with limited ORIF. And so going back to the treatment of our patient, JC, uh, she was managed with uh, an external fixator one day after reporting to the ED. Um, she was then uh, taken to the operating room uh, again to remove the external fixator. And she underwent, uh, as you can see by the x-rays here, she underwent uh, dual incision, uh, dual plating. Um, and she was uh, discharged approximately a week and a half after her admission. Um, she's gonna follow up in the office in uh, one to two weeks following her discharge and um, she'll remain non-weight bearing uh, for likely a significant amount of time, I believe three to four months. Um, she, as we saw in her CT scan and x-rays, she had a rather severe injury uh, to the tibial plateau. Uh, these are my references and I'd like to thank everyone for the time. Glad to take any questions. Any questions from the residents? I don't treat a lot of these injuries, Brian, um, but I think it's a, uh, you know, they've always been some of the toughest ones. You know, swelling can be a real issue. And I know there's a trend now towards, you know, direct and early, you know, RAF, you know, before the swelling kind of sets in. You know, I'm interested to see what those outcomes look like in the long term. Um, you know, I think external fixators have their challenges, but I think that they do have a role. Um, you know, I think. Uh, in the past, we worried a lot about infections, but I think with hydroxyapatite coated pins, we have less concern with that. Um, I think the key is just trying to restore alignment, restore stability, you know, and then get them to heal. Uh, and sometimes they need some help with that. Um, they take a long you know, time. Tom, to from. Go ahead, Mark. One of the reasons that the, the X fix people do well is that in circular fixers, you can weight bear them almost immediately. Right. And so that's the genius of ring fissures. The, some of the problems in the pins is if you get within the capsule of the joint, you're looking at a risk of septic arthritis. And again, some of these very vicious bicondylar fractures are just not amenable to minimally open to get a reduction, even though you could use the X6 to stabilize the extremity. You just can't do it. So if you're going to have to make two larger incisions to reduce, you might as well plate it. Right. Yeah, I recall having one of those where I got a pin very close to the joint line as it dips anteriorly. Uh, um, and I did that one with an olive wire so that the capsule was sort of held closed by the olive. But as soon as it started to move a little bit, the, the knee became septic very quickly. It was messy. No pin can be within 18 millimeters of the joint surface. They've shown that. So, you know, that's sometimes it, it doesn't give you the fixation you need. If, if you need to be closer, like the RAF screws that can be used with internal fixation. No further questions. Nice, Brian. Thank you very much, Jack. Jack McNamara is going to give our last talk for the morning. Thanks, everybody online for hanging in there. I know we're Getting close on time, but I think we did well with five presentations this morning. Jack, go ahead and get your talk queued up and yep. take it away. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. McFarland. Uh, I'm Jack McNamara, one of the fourth year medical students who's been rotating on the pediatrics and sports service for the past month. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, tibial tubercle fractures. So to get started, I'll give an overview of the case that provided the basis for the discussion. This is the case of BK, a 15-year-old male who presented to an outside hospital after experiencing a sudden pain around his left knee while he was conducting hurdles at track practice. Immediately after experiencing the pain, he was unable to ambulate with a normal gait and develop significant swelling around the left knee. At the outside hospital, x-rays showing a fracture of the left tibial tubercle obtained, at which point he was placed in a long leg splint and transferred to Robert Wood Johnson for further management. He has no relevant uh, family history and he has no past medical or surgical history. 
Physical exam performed to Robert Johnson showed intact skin with significant swelling around the left knee, along with tenderness to palpation of the left knee and tibial tubercle. The anterior, posterior, and lateral compartments of his leg were soft and compressible. Sensation was intact in the distribution of the superficial and deep perineal nerves, as well as the tibial nerve. Strength testing of the tibialis anterior, EHL, FHL, and gas arc were five out of five. Of note, uh, evaluation of his of knee extension was limited by pain. He did have brisk capillary refill, along with uh, palpable dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulses. Shown here are the images obtained at Robert Johnson. We have an AP view of the leg, as well as a lateral view of the knee and a lateral view of the leg. These were read as a Ogden four fracture of the left tibial tubercle, which with my cursor, I will draw out here, at which point surgical intervention was discussed. As far as this patient's treatment course, he did undergo an open reduction and internal fixation of that Ogden four left tibial tubercle fracture with two compression screws and post-operatively placed in a hinged knee brace that was locked in full extension. He was sent in the office at post-operative day six, at which point his incision was clean, dry, intact, nerve vascular intact, and the plan was to continue with neomobilization and follow-up in one month, which would put him at post-operative week six. Now with that, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of tibial tubercle fractures. These are relatively uncommon fractures, uh, estimated to account for about 0.4 to 2.7% of pediatric fractures. Of note, there's a higher incidence in males as compared to females, uh, with the ratio of 10 to one cited in the literature. And the average age of incidence of these fractures is about 14 and a half, uh, but most commonly seen between the ages of 12 and 15. As far as predisposing factors for these fractures, uh, what has been linked uh, to predisposing individuals include participation in athletics, involving jumping or initiation of sprinting, namely basketball, track and field, and to a certain extent, football and soccer. Uh, historically, Osgood Schlatter disease was described as a predisposing factor in the literature. However, no formal association has been established, and it is believed that this prior belief that Osgood Schlatter disease did predispose individuals was sort of affected by confounding uh, factors, same of which is true for Sending Larson Johansson syndrome. Now with that, I'll touch a little bit on the osteology of the proximal tibia, which does play into the pathomechanism of this injury. So the proximal tibia contains two ossification centers, the primary of which is the proximal tibial physis, and the secondary of which is the tibial tubercle apophysis. Ossification occurs in four stages, uh, the, prim uh, the first of which is the cartilaginous stage, which occurs prior to the development of that secondary ossification center, which is then followed by the apophyseal stage. This is marked by the appearance of the secondary ossification center, during which the physis underlying the tubercle is predominantly composed of fiber cartilage. During this stage, bone begins forming in continuity with the proximal tibial physis, uh, epiphysis, excuse me, closing in a posterior medial to anterolateral direction from uh, proximal to distal. The apophyseal stage is then followed by the epiphyseal stage, during which the fiber cartilage that underlies the tubercle is replaced by physial hypertrophic columnar cartilage in a proximal to distal fashion. The consequence of this is that this physial hypertrophic columnar cartilage is more brittle and less suited to Hansel tensile stretch, which I'll touch upon in the pathomechanism in the following slide. Finally, the osseous stage completes the uh, ossification during which fusion between the proximal tibia and the tubercle occurs, again occurring in a, post in a proximal to distal fashion. So with that background, uh, the mechanism of injury for these fractures include a, a tensile extensor stress placed on the tibial tubercle. The tibial tubercle is a site of insertion of the patellar tendon and is placed under uh, stress during contraction of the extensor mechanism, specifically the quadriceps muscle. As such, injury can be seen during concentric contraction of the quadriceps during jumping or initiation of sprinting, or an eccentric, contra eccentric, eccentric contraction of the quadriceps during forced knee flexion, such as it can uh, be seen during a fall. As far as the presentation goes, it sort of parallels how our patient presented with the sudden onset of pain after the initiation of uh, sprinting or jumping with the inability to immediately ambulate with normal gait. Additionally, the presence of knee effusion and tenderness uh, at the tibial tubercle is often seen. Extensor laggard deficiency due to uh, that avulsion of the extensor mechanism from its insertion can also be seen as well. As far as the male dis uh, female disparity that I mentioned earlier, this is postulated to be due to the increased quadricep strength in males as compared to females. However, alternatively, may be due to differences in athletic participation in the relevant age group or the later age at osseous fusion that occurs in males as compared to females. Now with that, I'll talk about the Ogden classification, which is the most commonly used classification for these fractures, with the type one being a fracture of the secondary ossification center near the insertion of the patellar tendon, and type two being propagation of that fracture approximately between the primary and secondary centers. Type three is a coronal fracture that extends posteriorly across the primary ossification center, and is the most commonly seen subtype of tibial tubercle fractures. Type four, the, uh, the type seen in our patient, includes a fracture through the entire proximal tibial physis, and type five is a complete periosteal sleeve avulsion of the extensor mechanism from the secondary ossification center. 
So it's uh, pictured here are some illustrations of each respective type of uh, the Ogden tibial tuberculosis fracture. I neglected to mention earlier that there is an A and B of modifier for displaced or for non-displaced and displaced uh, respectively. So seen here, we have a type one fracture involving the insertion of the patellar tendon on the tibial tuberosity. Type two, we have extension of that uh, fracture proximal towards the primary ossification center. Type three, we have that extension through the uh, in a coronal manner through the pro uh, primary ossification center. Type four involving the entire physis, and then type five, that avulsion of the insertion side of the extensor mechanism. And again, we have, in the interest of uh, time, I only included the relevant uh, radiographs. So seen here is a type three fracture, the most common, and then type four seen in our patient. As far as associated conditions, uh, while cited at occurring in about 4% of cases, compartment syndrome is a particularly worrisome complication of tibial tubercle fracture and is due to injury of the recurrent branch of the anterior tibial artery, which runs in close proximity to the structures involved. However, uh, one study uh, out of a level one trauma center over the course of seven years did cite an incidence of 20%, uh, incidence of 20% of compartment syndrome in patients presenting with tibial tubercle fractures. However, the large body of literature uh, confirms that number to be closer to 4% with no indication for any prophylactic fasciotomy needed. As far as soft tissue damage, 2% uh, of type three, or 2% uh, of these fractures are associated with meniscal tears, most commonly in the type three uh, fracture. And again, 2% of cases are seen uh, con with concomitant patellar or quadriceps tendon avulsions. As far as the treatment goes, the goal is to restore the extensor mechanism, ensure anatomic reduction, and restore the articular surface it is in, if it is involved. And typically with the type one, both displaced and non-displaced, and type two non-displaced fractures, this can be achieved non-operatively with close reduction and then lug immobilization. The reduction maneuver for these fractures include leg hyperextension, after which the patient is placed in a, either a long leg clasp or hinged knee brace lock and fall extension, made non-weight bearing, and continued mobilization for four to six weeks. Of note, premature uh, rehabilitation prior to the evidence of union across the physis may result in recurrent avulsion, thus indicating the need for close follow-up in these patients. As far as the uh, displaced fractures, there's those that extend through the primary ossification center, so these are our type 2B through 5 uh, Ogden fractures. These fractures are treated operatively, the mainstay treatment of which is open reduction and internal fixation with kyanulated compression screws. However, arthroscopic-assisted open fixation uh, can be used in injuries that extend into the joint or have associated soft tissue damage with it in order to evaluate those soft tissues and inspect the joint line if indicated. The same can be true of an open arthrotomy. However, it does appear that arthros arthroscopic-assisted techniques have been favored in the literature so far. Closed reduction with percutaneous pinning was also historically employed. However, the, uh, this technique was shown to be inferior for the most part compared to open reduction internal fixation. However, a recent study in 2010, uh, excuse me, 2021, did argue that because such so few of these fractures are associated with soft tissue injuries, there should at least be an attempt made to uh, reduce the fracture via closed approach with percutaneous pinning. However, this study was limited by a relatively low power. As far as the post-operative care for patients treated surgically, the patient is immobilized for four to six weeks, either in a long leg cast or hinged knee brace lock and full extension, and made non-weight made non-weight bearing with initial initiation of physical therapy at four to six weeks, depending on surgeon preference. As far as outcomes go, these patients tend to do well after both non-operative or operative management. A systematic review uh, conducted by Patel Mazzini et al. found that of the 336 patients identified, 99% of them demonstrated complete healing along with 98% demonstrating full restoration of range of motion at about 22 weeks, and 94% uh, being able to return to pre-injury activities at a mean of about 30 weeks, or 29 weeks, excuse me. As far as complications go, uh, these procedures are not without complications. 28% uh, of the patients identified in this review did report uh, some complications, the most common of which was bursitis. And in fact, 15% of patients uh, identified in the study required removal of hardware due to persistent bursitis. However, the refracture rate is low at about 6%. And then as far as uh, uncommon complications that can potentially have long-standing uh, further complications, excuse me, uh, genuine bottom and leg length discrepancy have been reported as potential complications, but are relatively uncommon due to the age at which these fractures uh, typically occur. The reason being is that when these patients present with tibial tubercle fractures, their physis, uh, the proximal primary ossification center has already begun that ossification process from proximal to distal. So there is no true, or it is uncommonly going to be seen where the concern is that a continued growth posteriorly despite fixation anteriorly. So with that, 
these are my references, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I think that was a nice review, Jack. Um, you know, only in the youngest patients do I consider alternative options for fixation. So, you know, I've had one kid in 15 years that I've taken the screws out because I was worried about, you know, uh, reeker bottom. Um, and I have used smooth pins twice in kids, you know, that were 10 or under. Uh, but you just usually don't see enough force, you know, to evolve that uh, in that age group. It's usually, you know, a little bit bigger kid. Um, and a lot of them are getting closer to the end of growth. You know, the 14, 15 year old basketball players, common, common presentation. Is there a um, minimum level of displacement that you would consider treating conservatively? Is there, is there a number when you start, start to see that, you know, that tubercle pulling away, but it's not completely off? I did not see any specific uh, displacement criteria for uh, operative indication, but my best guess would be is that if that extensor mechanism is affected by the avulsion, then that would lead me to be more, that would lean me towards operative intervention rather than conservative just to restore that, uh, the insertion site of the extensor mechanism. I mean, that's kind of the criteria that I use, but it's I, I've seen several of them where their extensor mechanism is nearly fully intact, kid can bear weight on it, can't run on it, but they can bear weight on it, they can fully extend, and yet the thing is pretty, I mean, it's it's impressively displaced on an x-ray, and so, I don't know, I, I worry that I'm getting away with it instead of, you know, not fixing some of those. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation this morning. I uh, just want to give a round of applause to all the students. I think you did a really good job on your talks.